Hey Hope, I was thinking about the inside and the outside. You know, there's a lot of people that we, we keep on the inside and we share a lot of stuff with them and other, other people, you know who they are. <laughs> we keep on the outside, right? So this one, this one will go on the inside. In fact, I'll, I'll leave it sticking out there a little bit. And this one, watch, because you'll see right as they switch. Now that one's on the inside and this is on the app. Being single isn't a curse or a mistake. Believe it or not, not everyone is meant to be married. But if you are looking for a love of a lifetime, just what should you be looking for? So you could see how I, I'm trapped in here. Sometimes people think, you know, I can like come through or come around the fingers or the thumbs, but watch, there's the first, there's the second. What? Do it happened? again. Yeah, do it. <laughs> what just happened? Can you do it uh, Yeah, here, we'll do it for, you guys could get underneath this time. We're gonna cheat the camera a little bit here. All right, so you could see, I can't just, you know, come around like this. He's stuck. Or, yeah, I'm stuck. I can't just come through or the fingers or the thumbs. Watch, there's a first, what? there's a second. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, you ready? Will you hold on to? Yes. Is that like this? You ready? Watch. Can you see over there? Mm -hmm. I know you could see. Uh, just keep your hands steady for me, okay? Watch, there's a first, there's a second. Wow. <laughs> Have you enjoyed this guy getting us ready every week as we've gotten into this series? But if I hear one more of you say, why can't he be our pastor? That's it. We're not going to have him back anymore. But it's good to see you this weekend. This is the sixth week of our series, House of Cards. We're talking about the illusion of a perfect family. And let's be honest, a lot of us on social media, we like to portray that we have perfect marriages and perfect family and perfect kids. And we know that's not true because we're broken, but we can be restored through Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that this weekend. I told you I'm going to be talking to singles and we're going to jump right in. So if you have a Bible with you, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you don't have the Bible, that's okay. We're going to put the verses up on the screen. But this is one of those very, very unique passages because the Apostle Paul talks specifically to singles. By the way, let me just say this. I found out, in fact, just today I found out that 45% of Americans 18 years and older are single. 45%. That's a lot. Uh, uh, here's some other things. For example, uh, Raleigh was picked just a couple of years ago for the best place to live if you're single. The fifth best place to live if you're looking for a mate. That's good news. You know what else I found out about singles? 40% of homeowners are single. 40% of Porsche buyers are single <laughs> with money. Yeah, I'm going to start checking your giving. You know what I'm saying, right? But I'm going to be speaking specifically to singles this weekend. And, and I've discovered over the year, uh, years, there's basically three kinds of singles. The first group are those of you, you just accept being single. You're, you're good with being single. Then there's some of you who just absolutely reject the idea of being single. And some of you, you haven't determined how you feel about being sim single. But when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, for what it's worth, Paul builds a case that being single could actually be better than being married. And right now, there's a lot of married people nodding. Yep, that, that Paul guy, he was a smart, smart guy. Right, right. But then there's a lot of singles sitting here. You hear that, and you're like, this guy, this Paul guy, he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul just gives us a couple of benefits of remaining single. Let me give you the first one. He says, if you remain single, you'll have less stress in life. Let me show you a verse. Some of, some of the married people are, man, this is a rowdy crowd. You guys have been drinking already. Anyway, anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 26, because of the present crisis, I think it's good for a man to remain as he is. Now, he's talking in the context of singles. You can read the entire chapter. But you need to know that Paul was a single man who at one time had been married. And I know that because was, Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. And to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. So Paul has either been widowed or he's been divorced. We don't know. A lot of people said his thorn in his flesh was his ex. I don't know if that's true or not. But and understand, Paul is speaking from the perspective of a single. And he basically is saying this. And he's talking about this present crisis. What was the present crisis? Well, this is first century uh, Rome. And this is first century Corinth. And these are these first century cities. And now these people are becoming Christians. And there's a lot of persecution going on. And families are being ripped apart. And families are being uh, persecuted. And Paul says, listen, it basically, listen, there's, there's a lot of stress that we're going through. And there would be less stress 
if you were going through this by yourself, if you weren't taking your family through with you. And then he says this in verse 27, are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. In other words, if you're committed, hang with it. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And then he says something interesting. And if a virgin marries, where he just talked about a woman marrying, then he talks about a virgin marrying, marrying, what's he talking about? Well, when he speaks to a woman, he's talking about someone who has been married. In other words, she's either been divorced or, or she's been widowed. When he talks to a virgin, he's assuming she's a virgin because she's never been married. <laughs> old the good old days. But anyway, if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. I want to spare you this. This is Paul's way of saying, if you don't have to get married, don't get married. And it's because one of the benefits of being single is you're not going to have to deal with some of the relational challenges. I think he refers to it here as the many troubles that you're going to have to deal with, you're going to have to face if you get married. It's just going to be more complicated. Now, if you're sitting here and you're single, you're probably thinking, there, there's nothing that could possibly be worse than being single forever. But you know what? I could introduce you to some people here this weekend who would tell you there's something a lot worse. And you know what it is? Rushing into marriage. And then into it thinking, mm, I'm not sure I married the right person. And then you add to that complications like in-laws, children, finances, sexual tension. By the way, if you're here and you're married and you find yourself in that situation, I've got some good news for you. I've got some encouraging news for you just a little bit later in this message. But Paul says to the singles, hey, like it or not, you're going to encounter less stress. You're going to have fewer problems and challenges in life if you remain single. Here's the second benefit. He says if you remain single, you'll have less distractions and conflict in life. Verse, 30, chap, verse 32, chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he could please his wife, or at least he should be. He should be trying to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And Paul said, he said, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's life. That's just the way it is. Then he says this, an unmarried woman or virgin is concerned. There's the, there, again, he differentiates. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of the world. How she can please her husband, or at least she should be. Then he says in verse 35, I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. Paul's like, I'm not just trying to be mean, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. And I think what Paul is saying is this. If you're single, at some point you should ask yourself this question. Hmm. I wonder if God is keeping me single because he has a plan for my life that I am only going to be able to accomplish by remaining single. Now here's the problem with that kind of question. Most of us are so short-sighted, we only think in terms of what do I need in my life to be happy right now? And we rarely consider that God may have something that's actually better for us than what we think we need. See, God, you may be single, God may have a plan for you that would blow your mind if you knew it right now. I mean, he, he may have plans to actually use you to change the world, but you'll miss all of that if all you can focus on, if all you're concerned about is one day getting married. And so the question is simply this. As a single individual, are you considering a life, as Paul calls it here, a life of undivided devotion? Like, God, I'm all in. What do you want to do in my life? Or is, or is, is that you know, even an option for you? So Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, listen, just so you know, there's nothing wrong with being single. In fact, God may use you in ways when you're single that he could never use you as you're married. But the re reality is this. 90% of you listening this weekend at any of our campuses that are single, statistics tell us that you're going to get married. So let's talk about that. Because here's the deal. If you're going to get married, you want to get it right. Because you've been around enough miserably married people. You're like, I don't want to be like that. So you want to make sure you get it right. And I think part of the problem is we don't spend enough time talking about how to choose a mate. I know we don't talk about that at church very often. We don't, we don't spend much time exploring the Bible and biblical principles about how to find the love of your life. And right now some of you are thinking, boy, I picked a lousy week to come to church. Right, right. But I want you to hang in there because what I want you to see is there's something in this for everybody. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're married. If you're married, this may help you understand why you're having some of the problems that you're having in your marriage, and you may get some insight as to how you can begin to address and fix some of these things. If you're divorced, it may help you understand why things went wrong in your first marriage, and maybe 
a better decision, how you can make a better decision of choosing the right person next time. If you're single and you thought, man, I think God has called me to be single, you're gonna get some great information that you can, you can give as wise advice and counsel to maybe other singles who could, should remain single. And if you're here and you're a parent or a grandparent, and I fall into both of those categories, you see, one day our kids are gonna grow up and they're gonna need advice. And our grandkids, they're gonna grow up and they're gonna need advice. So this is stuff for all of us. Every one of us, there's something here for us. Now let me just begin by saying this. When God wants to communicate to us, he, does, he, he, he uses a number of different ways to help us, help us discover what his will and what his plan is for our lives. You ever wonder, what's God's will for my life? God's got several, first of all, he may speak to you through his word. You may be reading the Bible and the light just comes on. Or sometimes God just speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's through circumstances. Sometimes it's just logic. Things are just lining up in a certain direction. Sometimes God will speak to us through other mature Christians. But the bottom line is this. However God chooses to speak to us, he's never, ever, 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 ever going to contradict himself. God is never going to say anything that contradicts what is written down in his word. I've had people sit in my office and try to justify the fact that they're having an affair and they believe that God is in it, that God led them to the love of their life. Finally, they found them. I'm like, you're an idiot. I mean, there's no way God led you into an affair, right? Because God is never going to contradict himself. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. God is not a God of disorder. Your translation may say God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And so if you're trying to make a decision and you're confused about what to do, and you're not finding clarity on what to do, you can be sure of one thing, God hasn't spoken yet. Because God is not a God of confusion. God is not a God of disorder. God is not a God of chaos. And so if you're, you're, at, you're at a crossroads of life and you're not sure what God is telling you, this is what God is telling you. Wait, be patient. In fact, one of the most important lessons we can learn as Christians is that unlike us, God is never in a hurry. And since he's never in a hurry, you know what that means? It takes patience. It takes time to discern what his plan is, what his will is for your life. In other words, when God speaks to us, rarely is it like a lightning bolt that comes down from heaven. In fact, when, when God is speaking to me, or maybe I feel like he's leading me to do something, I, I've gotten to this point in my life where I can see what's happening. I can sense what's going on. For the first thing, God gets, he gets me a little restless. I get a little uneasy about stuff. And then after that, you know, he begins to prod me a little bit and nudge me a little bit and maybe turn and shift me a little bit. And over time, it becomes clearer and clearer. That's the way God speaks to me most of the time. Now, in my life, there have been a few times where I feel like God has spoken very, very clearly to me. Not audibly. God's never spoken to me audibly. Oh, how cool would that be? Right. But anyway, you know, I felt like when, when I married Laura, God said, this is the one. I felt like that. I felt like when I was in California and we were living a really good life when God spoke to me and said, I want you to move and start a church. I felt like I, felt like I was very, very, very clear. But most of the time when God is guiding me and speaking to me and leading me, it's a process. It's like he's taking me on a journey. Now you're thinking, Mike, what does this have to do with choosing a mate? Well, let me, just, let me just begin by blowing away a couple of myths when it comes to romance and love and getting married. First of all, God does not choose a mate for you. I understand the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible's gonna give you some guidelines. The Bible's gonna look at some, give you some principles. We're gonna look at some of those, but the Bible doesn't teach that God has this perfect mate for you out there somewhere, okay? I've, here's a quote. Success in life consists not so much in marrying the one person who will make you happy, but in escaping the many who can make you miserable. See, that's just, that's just wisdom right there. But God's going to give you some guidelines, but it's up to you to choose a mate. Here's the second one. There is no one perfect person that God ordained for you to marry. There is no person that God created just for you that's going to complete you, you know, that's going to be your soulmate. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderfully romantic idea. Guess what? It's just not true. In fact, think about this logically. If that was the case, God picked the person that all of us are supposed to marry on the whole planet. All it would take with one idiot marrying the wrong person. They screwed it up for the whole rest of the world. You know what I'm saying? So that, that, that can't be the case. Now, so even though God doesn't choose your mate, even though God hasn't designed a perfect mate for you, the Bible does tell us the kind of mates that we should be looking for. So let me give you three criteria if you're looking. Here's the first one. It needs to be spiritual compatibility. And God is so clear on this one. In other words, you have to be on the same page spiritually 
if you're expecting there to be a oneness, if you're expecting that there's going to be some kind of incredible unity in your marriage, this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? And then he says this in verse 15. He makes it a little clearer. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And i got to be honest with you, the answer to that question in the context of, of what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the, the, the answer is nothing. And this isn't just marriage. I would really warn you when it comes to having a business partner. Do you really want to have a business partner who's not spiritually on the same page that you are? Or are they going to put you in a position where you have to maybe make a decision you don't want to make? So the Bible is very clear. Don't be yoked to people where you have to be involved in living life together, making decisions together, if you're a Christian and they are an unbeliever. And it's because Paul knew that you cannot have oneness. You cannot have unity with a person who rejects the most important thing in your life. It is absolutely impossible. Because if you're not headed in the same direction spiritually, I can promise you this. You will never attain the spiritual, uh, the, the emotional, the sexual intimacy that God created for you, designed for you to enjoy in a marriage relationship. It is just not going to happen. So you got to understand, listen to me, read my lips on this one. If you are a Christian, choosing someone to marry who is not a Christian, that is not an option for you. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, my boyfriend or my girlfriend isn't a Christian, but I'll convince them. I'll win them, right? That's what I call missionary dating. You know. <laughs> and occasionally it works, but I gotta be honest with you, the odds are stacked against it and you're playing with fire because if it doesn't work, mm, you're, you're in for a tough journey. Now, let me just say this. I don't like to make people unhappy. I actually like people to like me. It is a huge character flaw. And when it came to this, I used to kind of dance around this a little bit when I was younger in the ministry. But you know what? You haven't sat through all the counseling sessions that I've sat through because I went easy on this. And you haven't had to sit in my office and, and witness all the train wrecks that I've witnessed because Jesus wasn't at the center of a relationship. And so now I'm very blunt. So you can do that when you get older. You can just be blunt. See, so let me just say it. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, and you are considering marrying someone who is not a Christian, you are making a huge mistake. I don't care how great the person is. I don't care how charming they are. I don't care how winsome they are. I don't even care how hot they are. You are making a huge mistake. You cannot have emotional, sexual, and relational oneness if you don't first have spiritual oneness. And you don't need to pray about this. Because the Bible's very, very clear on this. But let's say even, let's say that both of you are Christians. Even that's really not enough. You should also have life purpose compatibility. Interesting verse, James chapter, or Amos chapter three, verse three. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? No. If you tell your neighbor, hey, you want to walk in the morning and you, you meet out in the cul-de-sac and they decide, well, I don't want to go that way. I don't want to go that way. Well, you're not going to walk together, right? It's the same way when it comes to our plans and our purposes in life. I remember when Laura and I were dating and we had a very, very short dating relationship. I met her in three weeks. I told her I loved her. About two weeks later, I asked her to marry me. And within nine months, we were married. Uh, and so we, we just kind of got, we got on the train and got it going, you know what I'm saying? And so when I, we were dating, we were sitting around one day, and I like to ask hypothetical questions. And I said, so, uh, Lord, let me ask you a question. What if God wants me to be a missionary in Africa? Will you marry me? She said, nope. <laughs> let me ask you a question. Was she being me? Mm -mm. Was she being shallow? No. Is she just really super unspiritual? I mean, after all, she is from Orange County, California. No, no. You know what? She's just being biblical. She knew that's not where God is leading me in my life. God is not leading me to be a missionary in Africa. Now, I will say this. Right before we were getting married, I had to have my second knee. I had two knee operations in college because of sports injuries. So I was having my second one. I had some ligament damage. And I was going into surgery the next day. I said, hey, babe. And I get a hypothetical. I said, hey, hey, babe. What if it goes really south and they amputate my leg? You're still going to marry me, aren't you? She said, no. And I said, well, that is shallow. So that is, I want you to see the difference between shallow and not shallow. <laughs> but here's the deal. 
I want you to I know, I talk about something. Here's the deal. You're not here by accident. You didn't just show, God has a purpose, a vocation, a ministry. He has a mission for you. Now, this is where the rub comes. Let's say that God has called you to be a missionary in Brazil. And he's called your fiance to work on Wall Street. I'm telling you why, you, you both may be great people. You may have an incredible relationship. You, you're just gonna have a hard time pulling that off. In fact, I believe one very important conversation that every couple should have when they're thinking through this process of getting married is this. Does what God has called us to do with our lives, does it overlap? And if it doesn't overlap, man, you need to really pump the brakes and think about going through with getting married. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I have talked to who over the years at one time felt that maybe God had called him or her into a particular ministry or a particular mission or they had a particular purpose for their lives, but he or she met someone, got enamored with someone, fell in love with someone, and they got married and it changed their plans, and then they had to put on the back shelf, they had to squelch what God had called them to do because of incompatibility with a spouse who was going in a different direction. And you've seen this story over and over again. As a result, they never experienced the fulfillment of doing what they felt God had called them to do. And often those people will live their lives with a lot of regret. And I think that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. Paul said, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not just trying to be mean, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now understand, in these two areas, spiritual compatibility and life purpose compatibility, God is very, very clear. I think what God is saying is, now these are the parameters from which you must choose, okay? Same spiritual commitment, same life purpose. And then he says, hey, listen, within these parameters, have a blast. Choose anybody you like. But here's the other thing. Even if these two areas line up, there's a third area that you probably need to consider, okay? It helps to have personal compatibility. Now, let me just say this. There is no verse in the Bible that says you have to be just like the person you're going to marry. I'm just saying the more you have in common, it just helps. Because if there's a lot of major differences between you and the person that you're marrying, you're just kind of looking for grief. Now, if these are minor issues, that, that's a different story, you know? If you like the toilet paper coming over the top and she likes it coming down from the bottom, well, you can probably work through that, or how to squeeze the toothpaste. You probably can get through that. But there's a, these are factors that you need to consider. For example, family. See, If you want to know what your mate is going to be like when you get married, just look at their family. See, understand that's where they learn their communicating style. That's where they learn their style of conflict resolution. That's where they learned all kinds of things that are going to determine what your marriage is going to look like. I made a list of some other things. Education level. You should at least consider that. Intelligence, verbal skills, ambition. I mean, if you got a lot of, you got a lot of ambition and drive, and you're marrying someone who has absolutely no ambition and drive, hello, that's going to create some problems. Uh, your view on child rearing. How many kids are you going to have? Hobbies, leisure, how about sex drive and sexual interest? These are the kind of things you need to take, talk through before you take the plunge. By the way, let me just say this. When it comes to sex before marriage, I've heard people say, well, you know, you wouldn't buy a car without taking it for a test drive. That sounds kind of smart, almost wise, almost like something Solomon would say. But this is what's interesting. Every statistic out there says that people who sleep together before they get married have a greater chance of getting a divorce than people who don't. You need to understand there are reasons that God, who came up with the idea of sex, designed it the way he designed it, and he designed it for a husband and a wife in a committed marriage relationship. But here's what you need to understand. You don't have to go to bed with somebody to find out about their sexuality. All you gotta do is look. All you gotta do is watch and observe, and it's pretty obvious some people respond certain ways to affection, other people don't. You can look at their family situation. You, you can see how open they are about sex, how freely they discuss it as a family. But even then, you know what? I'm just going to tell you from experience, this is an area you can grow in your marriage. I told you last week, Laura and I were 22 and 19 when we got married. We both saved ourselves for marriage. My dad never had the talk with me. He just assumed I knew, you know. I went on our honeymoon. I didn't really know. 
I knew I was ready, but I didn't really know. You know what I'm saying? But this is where you can grow together. Let me, by the way, let me just say a word, because I said something earlier about getting married and then thinking, oh, did I marry the wrong person? Let me say a word to those of you who are married about this area of compatibility. There's an old saying that says, what, well, opposites? That's exactly right. But then they attack. <laughs> we get attracted to people that are opposite of us because they're not like us, but then we get in a relationship and we fight all the time. And it's because the more different you are, the more challenges you are going to face. And some of you are married and you've discovered that. So let me just say this, right now, your future as a couple depends on how much you're willing to grow, how much you're willing to change, how much you're willing to adapt. It depends on how unselfish you are and how selfish you're willing, unselfish you're willing to be and whether or not you're willing to get help in those areas where you know you need to get help. Because I will be honest with you, some couples will absolutely let their differences destroy them. Then there are other couples that will take their differences and use them to grow and use them to become stronger as a couple. I'll just tell you, Laura and I are a good example of the fact that compatibility helps, but it's not necessary. Because in most areas of life, Laura and I could not be more different. She's analytical. She will analyze everything. I just kind of go with my gut. She's financially responsible. I'm just like, hey, let's give it away. You know, we would never retire if it was up to me. She's very patient. I'm impulsive. She's flexible. Hey, let's try this. Let's try that. Nope, I ate at that restaurant last, the last four years. That's where I want to continue to eat. I'm the kind of person, if I go on vacation and I like the spot, why would I go somewhere else? I want to go right back there next year. Why would you go to Europe when you go, go to Epcot? You can see the whole world in four hours and drink the water. You know what I'm saying? That's where I want to go. See, that, I'm not very flexible. She's very mature, always has been. I'm like a big kid. See, I'm obsessed with being on schedule. I mean, when I do take my family to Disney World, it's like, okay, at 8.03, we got to be in the van. We should be pulling in the gate at 8.37. By 9.05, we should be through the gate. Should be on our first ride by about, I don't know, 9.19. We got, um, and they're like, oh, can we just relax a little bit and get a cone of ice cream? No, we got, you know, so I, that's what Laura's like. Let's just go with the flow, right? You know, Laura's car is always a disaster. I drove it one day. There's a family. There was a family living in there she didn't even know about. They were gypsies. And she did, I said, honey, did you meet the gypsies? They're really nice. They're living in your back seat. You know, I didn't know that. My car is always immaculate. I can't eat anything without getting food on my shirt. She's Miss Manners, you know. I'm telling you, we don't agree hardly. In fact, in fact let me just tell you. Laura makes 95% of all the decisions in our marriage. You know why? Because it didn't take me long to figure out she's smarter than I am. She just is. Laura bought one of our homes while I was in Africa. She called me on a satellite phone in the middle of the rainforest and said, I bought a house. Okay. I'm sure I'll like it. But I'm okay with that. 95%. We just don't have much stress. And I know what some of you men, well, I tell you what, I'm the man at our house. I'm the king of my castle. I, don't know. I tell you what, you'd love my life. I'm a kept man. I'm telling you, she, just, she does everything for me, right? In fact, the one thing, the one thing that we have going for us is our commitment in our relationship to Jesus Christ and our mission that he's called us to. That's it. That is the glue that has just kind of held us together for 41 years. In fact, what has allowed us to have a solid marriage, not a perfect marriage, but a solid marriage, is our willingness to accept, but not only accept, embrace each other's differences, and then our willingness to use those differences to make us much, much stronger as a couple than we could ever be as individuals. And I'm just going to tell you, if we could pull that off and we could survive the odds, I'm just telling you, you, you can do that too. You just got to decide what hills do you want to die on. I mean, I was telling a couple between services, I said, you know what? Laura said something to me yesterday and it really hurt me. I mean, it really did. It really, I'm not joking. It really hurt me. And I'm thinking, I should tell her about that. And then I thought, man, what difference will it make? Then she's going to be hurt that she offended me. And you just let it go. You just got to decide what's worth even having a conversation about sometimes. Now, let me just say this. If you're single, there are three words that I want to leave you with in closing. Here's the first one. Rejoice. 
Just rejoice. You don't need to sit around wondering, oh, why haven't I experienced God's best in my life? Let me tell you something. You're experiencing God's best in your life <laughs> because this is God's plan for your life right now. It's not when I get married, I will experience God's best. You are experiencing God's best right now. And you can rejoice in that because right now, this is where God wants you. Like with the story of Esther. He has you where he has you for such a time as this. Now that may change in the future. But right now he has you right where he wants you. So rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. Here's a second. Refocus. In other words, stop focusing on finding a mate. And start focusing on being the most Christ-like person you can be. I remember a few years ago I had a young girl come to my office. And I think she had gotten pregnant when she was like 16. She had the baby. She worked. She went on to the University of North Carolina. She got her degree. And in that journey, she met a lot of guys she fell in love with. They fell in love with her. But when it got really close to getting married and making the commitment, none of the guys were man enough and mature enough to be a father to. And they would break it off and run away. And so she came to my office, and I didn't really know why she was coming in. But she told me that story. But before she told me the story, she says, I just want to talk. I don't need you to say anything. I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right. And she told me the story. But she, then she got to this point. She said, so this is what I decided. I'm never pursuing another guy in my life. I'm pursuing God. I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to love God. I'm going to be the godliest woman that I can be, the godliest mother that I can. And if God happens to bring somebody in my life, fine. But that's not my pursuit anymore. And when she finished, I said, can I say one thing? <laughs> and uh, I said, you're ready now. Now you're ready. She said, what do you mean? I said, now you're ready. If God wants to bring somebody in your life, now you're ready. And within a year, she met a, a man at our church. He was a single father. He had never been married. And they got together, and I did their wedding. And I'm not saying that's the way it's supposed to be, but I'm saying it's amazing when you just focus on yourself. How can I be healthy when I do get married? How can I be the person that's going to be like the person that I want to marry? See, so when you rechannel that energy you've been spending horizontally looking for someone, you decide to go vertical, you know, you focus on your relationship with God. Do you know what you discover? You discover just how good God is and just how faithful God is, either in maybe finding you a mate or giving you incredible satisfaction in life without a mate. So rejoice, refocus. And the third one, it, might, it might, might sting a little. Relax. Nobody wants to date a person who's a nervous wreck over whether or not they're ever going to find the right person or whether or not they're ever going to get married. Right? Just relax. And if God does lead you into marriage, great. But please don't ask me to do the wedding. But anyway, great if God leads you into marriage. But just make sure, just make sure that you can Relax, find peace, find contentment with being single. And then see what God does. Now, next week, we're going to wrap up our series. And we're going to wrap up the series by talking about four principles, four steps you need to know to restore a marriage, to restore a father, son, a father, daughter, a parent, child relationship. How do we actually make our families that are hurting healthy? And we're going to see it in the story of the prodigal son. And I think I put it together in such a way you will always remember these. And if you will apply them, you're going to see God begin to work in your relationships. Father, thank you. Thank you for what we've learned in this series. I thank you for those who are single because we have some incredibly godly singles at Hope Community Church. And we're so blessed to have them here. We thank you that we've, you've brought them here because we're better. We're so much better with them here. And Father, for many of them, at one time, you are going to lead them across the path of the person that, that they're going to spend their life with. But some, Father, you have plans that are going to blow their mind, and it may not include a spouse. And I pray that they will find that contentment. I pray that they'll find exactly what they're looking for in this journey that you're taking us on called life. And we give you the credit for what you're going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. 
Thank you so much for joining us for this week's message. We are so excited to be a small part of all the great things that God is doing in and through your life. If you would like to take the next step in your spiritual journey, download the Hope app to find out ways to connect, opportunities to serve, and other resources. And if you'd like to contribute financially to our vision of reaching the triangle and changing the world, visit us at gethope.net slash giving. Thank you for your commitment to resourcing hope as we love people where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus.